Well, good Wednesday evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. We've been looking at the life of Samuel for the past several weeks in our scripture tonight. Um, we're going to see something happen to Samuel that we never see happen with our superheroes. Let me start off this way. How old is Superman or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman? Superman was introduced to the world in June of 1938. At the time, he was a reporter for the Daily Planet, which means he had graduated from college, from journalism school. So he had to be over 22, and he was a reporter, not a cub reporter, as they would have called him back then. So he was probably between 25 and 30. If that was the case, he would be at least 107 years old now. But he doesn't look a day older. Spider-Man's a teenager when he's introduced in August of 1962. Now, if we were to say he was 17 or 18 at the time, then he would be about 76 now. But again, he doesn't look a, a day over 20. Still looks like a teenager. Wonder Woman was an adult when she was introduced in 1941. If, if we say she was a young adult, 22 years old, then she would be about 101 years old now, but she hasn't aged either. See, that's the difference between fictional superheroes and our heroes in the Bible. Uh, look at the first, uh, first three verses of 1 Samuel chapter 8. The first three verses. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel. The name of his second son, Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in the ways, in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Samuel became old. Now, the same thing will happen to all of us, if it hasn't already. If we live, we'll become old. Now, that's not an indictment of old people. It is actually a promise. Samuel served the Lord his whole life. He's still serving the Lord in this passage. Perhaps he doesn't get around as good as he used to. Perhaps people don't see him traveling from city to city as much as they used to. But Samuel's still serving the Lord. Samuel appointed his sons to be judges, like it was a, a family business, so to speak. Now, this business of succession of sons following fathers was a, a very difficult one in the Bible. Eli's family was pretty much a flop, as was Samuel's. David and Solomon had trouble with their sons, as did a whole lot of the kings after them. Samuel is, by all accounts, a hero to Israel. But in that case, in the case of his family, he failed. His sons were selfish and crooked. And their greed and their corruption was public enough to be noticed by everyone. Look at verse Four. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. What we have is political unrest. The people are seeking a different form of government. The idea of Israel was that it was to be a theocracy. That meant God would be king of Israel and God's commands would be passed down through the priests. And when the priesthood proved unable to do that, then God raised up judges who were both political and religious leaders. Oftentimes they were also military leaders. It doesn't appear that Samuel ever took any real leadership of any military encounters, but he was a judge and a spiritual leader for the people. He, he judged the people on the matters of the law, and he interpreted and spoke for God on matters of faith. And the people, it seems, are not satisfied with this arrangement. Actually, if we go back and look, God had said to both Abraham and to Moses that the people would one day have a king. The problem is in what else they ask for. In verse 6, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, 
And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, according to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing, also doing to you. Now then obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Samuel goes to the Lord, tells them what's going on, and tells the Lord that he's unhappy. Samuel doesn't like what the people are saying. The people are saying, you know, Samuel, we love you, but we need something else. Now, this was an affront to Samuel's leadership, and, and that must have hurt. But Samuel's used to the people only half listening to him, so there must be something else going on. They asked for a king so that they could be like other nations. Even though they wanted a king, that, that, may about, that may not have been too far for the Lord. But they wanted to be like other nations. And that was something they were to never be. God had called Israel to be unique. Their faith practices were unique. Their laws were unique. Their diet was unique. Their government was to be just as unique. And now they're asking to be like other nations. Now, if we were to go and stand in the middle of Israel at that time and take a look at the neighbors, we'd see that the various Canaanite tribes had city-states. There wasn't a national leader across all of Canaan. The Philistines were more tightly organized, but they were led by a, what we would call a council made up of the heads, maybe even called kings, of the five major cities. To the north was Syria, and to the south was Egypt, and they both had a king like Israel was seeking. Syria was the center of Baal worship, and Egypt had many gods and held Pharaoh up as a God. These are the examples Israel's leadership is asking to copy. If we look at verse 10, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. Samuel sternly, if we keep reading that passage, Samuel sternly warns the people, the king will own you. That's his basic warning. The king will own you. Your stuff will become the king's stuff. Your children will be drafted into the king's personal service. Your taxes will double. In verse 17, Samuel spells it out as plainly as he possibly could. You shall be his slaves. Then Samuel the prophet lays a little bit of prophetic wisdom on them. It says, in the day when you cry out. Now, this isn't an if statement. There would be a day when the people would complain. And it says, on that day, the Lord would not answer their complaint. God's warning to the people is, is like the old saying, if, if you make your bed, you'll have to lie in it. If you make this choice, you'll have to live with it. We skip over to verse 19. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and all of those warnings he just gave. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Political unrest is not unusual. Samuel faced it. We're facing it in our day. The leader, the king that would be chosen was unprepared. He was indecisive. He was unfaithful and he was actually ill-suited to be king. In other words, they got the government they deserved. Many people say the same thing about us here in our country. Rather than worrying about who shall lead us, perhaps we would be better served on focusing on improving ourselves. If the people had been seeking the Lord and striving to serve him, they wouldn't have needed a king. They would have had the best 
that they could have under God's plan. God gives us good examples in his word. The Bible is full of heroes, some of which did amazing things. But they're all human. They all had flaws. They all, at one time or another, messed up. If our only models were superheroes who never aged, who never made mistakes, then we would never be able to identify with them. And if all the notable people in the Bible or in our lives were superhuman, then Jesus would not have been unique. But Jesus was special. And that's the reason that he and he alone is qualified to be our Savior and our King. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this word today. Lord, help us to, to see the mistakes that people in the Bible make. Some of them are heroes. Some of them just the ordinary folks like us. And they make mistakes. They choose badly. They, they go down the wrong path. Lord, we see that. Help us to learn from those mistakes. Help us to learn that, that we're not superhuman, that we have those flaws that, like Samuel, we're going to age, that we're going to make mistakes, make wrong choices. And Father, we also know that Jesus is our hero, our true one and only hero. Jesus lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death not for anything that he had done, but because of what we've done, because of our mistakes. And Lord, he was raised from the dead. And he lives there in heaven with you. He sits at your right side and intercedes, talks to you about us. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for letting him be our hero and our savior and our king. And Father, tonight in Jesus' name we come bringing our country to you. We're just a few days away from an election and there's a lot of political unrest in our country. And for a large part, it's for the same reasons there was political unrest in Samuel's day. We've neglected you. We've forgotten you. We've disobeyed you. Father, forgive us as a country. Let us return to looking to you first, not to politicians, not to political movements, not to anything else, but only to you and to your word, the Bible. And Father, for those that are suffering with coronavirus, for those in our neighborhood that have experienced loss even this day, Father, we pray your grace and your comfort. We pray for strengthening and encouragement. We pray for your Holy Spirit to stand beside them, to be their advocate, to be their strength and their helper. Father, we pray for our country, we pray for our city, we pray for our community, and for our church. We ask you to help us to be light, reflecting the light of Jesus, encouraging those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks again for joining me tonight. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday here at New Bethel. And if you can't, join us online again.